Hello, everyone. Welcome to Build's Character. I am joined by uh, Lauren Urban, who plays our Carrie Eldrex on Silver and Steel and is also our, our esteemed community manager over at D&D Beyond and uh, kind of an expert in all things D&D Beyond, I would say. Mm. I'm saying it. I'm making, I'm making the call. Uh, today, we are going to show you something really cool that you can do on D&D Beyond, and that's how to make your own subclass or to import a subclass, whatever you want to do, you can homebrew a subclass on D&D Beyond. And uh, well, Lauren has do done this. I have never done it before. So this is going to be an interesting learning moment <laughs> for me. There's it was an interesting us. learning moment for me too. And yeah. I'm, I'm going to refute your statement that I'm an expert. We have experts on our forums and our Discord. Um, I'm just going to blanket put this out there. If you have questions either about creating anything homebrew in D&D Beyond or the actual, um, not just the, the technical creation, but the how do I actually make a homebrew thing, come to our forums, come to our Discord. There's a lot of people who have a lot of experience doing both of those things that can help you out. I am not an expert. I'm the person who knows where to point you to the experts. But I have created a subclass and I did stick it up on D&D Beyond with a lot of help. And we have infinite us right now, which That's, I love. I'm trying not to look at the infinite Look us. all the way deep, look all the way into it. No. Feel the psychic damage. <laughs> no, this is the Far Realms and I am upset. This is how the Far Realms work. Okay. This is, this is what so happens. What am I doing? How am I making a subclass on d, d Beyond? Well, so if you go to collections, you'll see this is where all of your stuff lives. This is also where you can create all of the homebrew that you want. The, um, yeah, you'll see on the right-hand side, you can browse homebrew or you can create your own homebrew. And yeah, we are going to do a subclass, which is not the easiest thing to go through. I would highly recommend if you're doing a homebrew for the first time on D&D Beyond, try out like a spell or a feat or or something like that. Something that maybe has a few different, uh, a few smaller mm -hmm. sections in it. But hey, we got an hour. Let's Let's do this. Yeah, uh, I also highly recommend everyone try to design subclasses themselves. It will melt your brain. <laughs> I've done a few. Um, it's very difficult, uh, and I'm excited for this. So tell me, first off, what are we creating today? So I, I click Create Subclass. What did, what, you, what did you come up with? So my cleric is a, it's a cleric subclass that is the Domain of the Phoenix, because the advice that i was given a while back when i got into doing some official homebrew not just like little bits of homebrew for my D, &D game was go with something you personally would like to use and mm. a while back my cleric started praying to a phoenix and the idea of creating a subclass based on that had been knocking around in my brain for a while so this is this is what we went with and uh, you have a couple of options here. You can create something from scratch or you can select an, ex an existing template to go off of. Mm -hmm. The templates are useful if you're making small alt alterations. Uh, let me also say for homebrew purposes, if anybody's making any homebrew on D&D Beyond, if you, you can make anything you want and keep it private and mm -hmm. it'll be just yours and your D, D groups to use when you make something public that's when you need to own it so make sure you have all the rights to it so if i come in and i'm like well i really like the the light domain but i just want to change this one thing about it it's not going to be quite unique enough to say that you own it and can publish it but mm -hmm. this is a a whole new subclass um the other th nice thing about selecting from an existing template is you can go in and use the template as a way of making sure that you have all the right things in there. Most subclasses have a, a standard system to them. You're going to get powers at certain levels. You're going to get abilities at certain levels. You're going to have spells you can use. So using an existing template is often a really useful thing if you are new to using the D&D Beyond tools and want to make sure you don't miss anything. So for this, um, I would actually suggest let's use a template and let's use the light domain um, because why not? And then you can kind of see how that subclass was built and that makes it a little easier to go in and say, oh, but this power is actually this and this power is actually that. So go ahead and say create. Okay. Subclass has been created. Yep. <laughs> that's, that's how I narrate this for me. 
<laughs> subclass has been created. We need movie phone voice. Um, so yeah, so you're going to see a lot of stuff here that's going to make a lot of sense. Obviously, it's calling it a copy. It's going to be something that's in your homebrew. And you can see right away where there is stuff and where there isn't. Um, so for example, one of the first things that we might want to do is change the name. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And what what did you call this? So this is the Phoenix domain, which is consistent-ish with all of the rest of the domains that you get as a cleric. Okay. So we're going to call this the Phoenix domain. Nothing, nothing too flashy. Well, it's pretty flashy. Yeah. It's a lot of fire. Uh, and then for version, because... Chances are good you're going to make something and then you're going to want to update it or change oh, it or alter that. it. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of people who have a, a bunch of different ways of doing versions. It's kind of up to you. Mm -hmm. I suggest the first time you're going to put something into D&D Beyond, make it 0.5. Make it a beta okay. or whatever. So Yeah, but, yeah. 0.5 tells you, you're like, okay, I'm doing my best. <laughs> yeah, this might not be exactly because eventually what you're going to want to do is save it. You know, there's there's two different things that are going on with homebrew. You're playtesting the actual mechanics, but then when you're building it in D&D Beyond, you're playtesting the actual build probably in your character sheet. Mm -hmm. So knowing, oh, this is the version that uh, I haven't fixed this thing yet. Mm -hmm. That's that's usually pretty a pretty good place to start. Okay. Um, so these are the descriptions that you can see. Yeah, so um, there's a short description and the regular description, and these are not filled out. Those are not. I'm going to actually pull up my... Because um, a lot of this is stuff that you don't necessarily have to do right away. Uh, the other thing that'll help is where it says short description, there's a little asterisk, and then you see a little... Um, yep. It'll actually give you tips. It'll tell you, hey, what is this? Because okay. these are these can get into some very complex tools because creating a subclass or creating a spell or any of that is is a little bit complex. So um, it, it keeps it blank, even though you've made a copy of the light domain. It's done so mechanically, but not in description. Am correct. I wrong? Yeah. And and you'll see a lot of the stuff will actually still be in there because we've created this this yeah. copy. And the reason I like using the templates is because it also is a reminder of things. So if you scroll down, you can see um, additional specific spells. That's where we're adding in the spells that you get for your domain. This is actually where it happens. Mm. So uh, some of it, it's, it's not a class feature. It's something that you actually... Um, doing that little box right there. Here's, you know, what's your spell casting ability? Um, is there a prepared type or known spells? You know, depending on what subclass you're doing, it, mm -hmm. there's a lot of, of different options. Um, I am pulling up my Phoenix domain to back end. Uh, let's see. So um, I think you have a copy of the Word document that has my short and long description in it so okay. you can add that now if you want to you can copy paste or you can we can just go write it now. out right now I, no. hey, uh, if you want i could i could dictate we could be that kind of show i, I got questions from chat already so. and, and you had and you designed this with a lot of help from uh friends of ours absolutely yeah i made this and then I got a bunch of people to play test it before I'd even published it on D&D Beyond. And then after I published it, I got a lot more help and uh, paid for an editor so that I could do something that was as close to a professional quality as possible because this was, this was my first major subclass. This is my first homebrew subclass. I've homebrewed some other stuff and I've published some stuff on DMs Guild, but this is the first one. And there's a specific way that Wizards of the Coast actually formats and flavors and describes things that having that consistency is really important. Mm -hmm. And having an editor who knows about that consistency is really important. Uh, you might it's almost have like musical of... notes because it, it does help you when you're reading new subclasses and learning new things. Like the, the wording of it is so specific. It, it kind of helps guide uh, new players, especially, I think. Uh, so I put it in the full description. I didn't make it short description. So 
Yep. So I do have a short description as well. Usually uh, the difference between a description and a short description is um, when the, you're looking in the character sheet. Oftentimes in order to avoid having a incredibly long description of something, you know, that has all the flavor in it in the character sheet, there'll be a shorter version mm -hmm. so that you're not filling the character sheet, the D&D Beyond character sheet with all this extra information. Okay. Um, so usually for this case, for my description, it was a, a shorter version of that specific thing um i actually just have like a sentence so we can we can scroll on down and get to some of the meat of stuff i will just do that temporarily okay <clears throat> and i'll shut that in there so it's there there you go and uh i'm gonna read this real quick some believe that the creation and destruction that oh sorry some believe that creation and destruction are two sides of the same coin god this is weird hearing you read my subclass those who <laughs> <laughs> this is a weird moment. <laughs> those, those who respect respect power and danger of fire will uh, wait. I'm saying this all wrong. I'm butchering it now. You got me nervous. All right, you want me to read it? I'll no, read no, it. no, no, no. Oh, okay. You. <laughs> I mean, you got this, but the, those who respect the power and danger of fire, while admiring its beauty and light, are drawn to worship the phoenix. A neutral, though benevolent spirit, they embody the dichotomy between renewal and relentless destructive power. Life and death are inextricable. Now, that's a word I have trouble saying. I, I talk for a living and I have trouble saying inextricably. <laughs> there you go. You got it. Right there. It's right there with the, right the there. other spell I don't like to talk about. Linked in an enduring cycle, one to be celebrated and protected in equal measure. Clerics who follow the Phoenix understand that new life can rise from the ashes of destruction. That fire can both harm and heal, and that adapting to change is the most powerful constant. Special thanks to Adam Walton, Dustin Fletcher, Eugenio, Eugenio Vargas, Vargas, James Hake, Hannah Rose, Josh uh, Simons, Mackenzie Diarmas, and Justice Armin. So... Some of these people are uh, playtesters play of mine, and some of these people offered some early advice or were people like Hannah Rose is actually my official editor. I paid her to do final edits on the final version of this. So if you come to D&D Beyond, you can get version two, Electric Boogaloo, which has been edited. So, <laughs> Perfect. Um, so yeah. It's and fantastic. Then, I do have a couple questions from chat that I want to get too far away from. One of them being um, from Lendon. Lendon, how much does it cost for an editor? Um, that is something you're going to want to just contact an editor and tell them because a lot of them charge by word and uh, will be flexible depending on what kind of content they're asking you, you're asking them to edit. So mm -hmm. something shorter, um, they might be able to, to work with you a little bit more depending on your budget. So definitely talk to an editor. I'm, I don't think I'm qualified to talk about specific costs. However, I will say uh, the work that Hannah did, if, if there are words in here that you enjoy and you think that things make sense, that's Hannah. She made my words good. <laughs> if, if there is something in here you are confused by, that's still me. Yeah. So definitely an editor is absolutely worth it. And a qualified editor will also be able to help you with things like style. And the, the, that thing that I was talking about and where phrasing of specific things that is consistent across all of D&D 5e, they'll be able to help with that to be able to um, make it easier for your players to understand because they can't see inside your head and tell what you were thinking. Um, from Lord Garthon, what is your favorite piece of homebrew you've created, spell, magic item, or anything? I mean, this is this is kind of it, although I really do like create uh, breakfast and coffee. I do like that a lot. Yeah. How about you, Tom? What's your favorite piece of homebrew you created? <laughs> I haven't I haven't played it. Well, mainly the horrible monsters I make people fight. Uh, I'm very fond of some terrifying moths that I create that can mimic the form of, uh, well, anyone really. Um, they're one of my most horrifying monsters, right up there with the Avon, Avon Hydra. So, uh, <laughs> yep. Um, another question, um, about versions. So someone's asking version 0.5, one, one final version. I, I think it's up to you how you want to actually list them as long as you are consistent within yourself. I yeah. think there's probably people who have much stronger opinions about that than I do. I feel like as long as you are just a uh, very obvious and consistent, that's all that matters. Yeah. 
Um, Daniel Burns wants to know, is there a PDF of how Wizards of the Coast wants these for publishing? If you go to DMs Guild, there's a lot of information on DMs Guild. Yeah. That is an excellent resource for publishing. And then I would just highly suggest look at what's been published. Look at the official books to see how things have been published. You'll get an idea of style and the format right away. Um, what I also like about this is uh, this is a great way if you want to play test a subclass with lots of people and make it very easy on them, mm -hmm. having that homebrew and sharing it in your campaign is extremely useful because that requires, I think, a lot less of them and makes them more apt to get back to you very quickly. Oh, yeah. And you get the, the double fun of you create it and then you send it off to your playtesters and they're playtesting not just the mechanics of the subclass, but the, hey, how come this ability in my character sheet doesn't work? And then you got to go in and <laughs> right, right. figure that out. But let's let's keep going. We're on to additional specific spells. Yeah. So because this is a cleric, obviously we're keeping the spell casting ability the same, but we'll want to get rid of a bunch of these, not all of them. Um, so Burning Hands is the same, but we'll get rid of Daylight. Mm -hmm. We'll get rid of Fairy Fire. Mm -hmm. um, I, can't imagine you, I can't imagine you got rid of Fireball. Uh, no, Fireball is still in there. Flame the is still in there. Flaming Sphere is still in there. <laughs> uh, we'll get rid of Guardian of Faith. Uh -huh. I did get rid of Scorching Ray. Oh, that I'll had to hurt. Well, I'll, I'll explain in a minute, and we'll get rid of Scrying, but we keep Wall of Fire. So when I was coming up with the Domain spells because of the idea of the phoenix being half about healing and half about burn and fire, I was yeah. trying to pick a spell on either side that was one for each. So right. for your first level spells, you get burning hands and cure wounds. Right. Um, and okay, I was also, so cure wounds. Yep, so we got to add cure wounds in there. Ooh, we got a lot of spells. What's the what's the best? We just uh, Do we just type C. and it shows up? Yep. There we go. That's, there you go. Okay, I was going to say, because... It's smart that Rolling adventures. Yep. What's at next? third level, we get Flaming Sphere, which is already in there, and Gentle Repose. So Gentle Repose is the one you want to add. Um, at fifth repose. level, you get Fireball, which is already in there, and Revivify. Many of these, that. which are already available to clerics, but this lets clerics. This is this is automatically prepared. Yeah, which is helpful. Um, at seventh level, you get Wall of Fire, which is already in there, and Death Ward. Oh, we already put Wall of Fire in there. Sorry. Yep, so it's, uh, Death Ward is the new one. Yeah. You do like your Death Ward. You got to Death Ward your halflings. Yeah, except Mainly you got to Death Ward B. Dave Walters playing well, freely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> except least, right now I can't. Our least tanky boy of action. <laughs> Listen, he, he runs in. Someone's got a tank, right? And he's, he's happy to he, do it. He's got like all of 15 hit points. <laughs> You got but Death Ward, that kid. He's, he does have a lot of abilities to do a lot of damage very quickly at melee and when people hit him. So, um, and then at ninth level, I've got or ninth, uh, I've got Flame Strike and Raise Dead. So these are the fifth level spells, but you get at ninth. Um, All right, Raise Dead. So these will automatically now be added to your spells as uh, automatically prepared and automatically available to you if they're not a cleric spell. Now, I have a question about cleric spells. Aren't sure. the additional specific spells usually spells that you would not have as a cleric? They can be. In D&D. &D. Not all of them. If um, if you open up a list of the cleric domains and look, all of the spells that you get yeah. are, uh, and it's not just clerics, it's any of the subclasses, there's usually a mix because the idea is these are not going to count against your prepared spells and these are um and that's useful especially for clerics who we were constantly picking spells at the beginning of the day so mm -hmm. having kind of your bread and butter for your subclass always there right it, it's it's useful and then it's a flavor thing you know these spells make sense and yeah some of them you would have access to but some of them you don't like fireball uh flame flame strike you do um wall of fire a lot of the fire ones you don't and yeah. you'll actually see the uh first thing you get in this subclass is a spell that clerics normally don't have access to to help with that having access to fire spells and it's it's a good reminder that like clerics work very differently than say a warlock like warlocks have their additional spells are quite literally spells they would not normally be able to cast 
yep. otherwise. That's the whole point for them. Clerics, yeah, there's that whole like, you know, well, if this is the dead and cho- choose raise dead, you know, like <laughs> and Which, that regret. <laughs> yeah, that always <laughs> that that can get you. But then if your subclass is based on a flavor that should always have that it can it can feel a little weird so this kind of yeah this is less about does a cleric have access to the spell and does it make sense that this cleric has access to it all the time it's a great way to steer identity exactly yeah. i'm going to recommend at this point you hit save changes yep. and Don't i'm going to recommend to save save often save frequently yeah. and <laughs> uh, and just whenever you do if you spend more than 5 minutes working on something save so that's going to get us the basic information that we need. Uh, there's places for an avatar there uh, if you want to add. Uh, but I think we should move down into class features while I answer this awesome question by Alt F4 will help. If burning is the major concept, why no vicious mockery? Anyway. <laughs> So if you add, if you hit the little plus next to add class features, it'll actually expand the section for class features and we can see what's there. And this is why I, I recommend, unless you are very familiar, to use a template when you are creating something. Because this right away will help, especially for something like subclasses. Oh, can you go back for just a second? Yeah. I was trying to think of a comeback. Oh, no. Oh. Resubmit oh. your form. Yeah. Well, this is why we save. This don't is why you, we save often hit and that always. Back button. I was yeah. trying to think of a shade comeback, but like Shadow Sorcerer does come with darkness. And, yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> so yeah, go ahead and hit that little plus next to add class features instead of the actual add and we'll oh, expand this. And you can oh, see. Oh, that's how that works. Okay. Yeah, because we are using a template, you can actually see for clerics, it's already got listed mm-hmm. uh, the six different things that you get as a cleric. Because as you've noticed, as most people probably know with all of the classes, the subclasses tend to follow a prescribed order of at this level you get something, at this level you get something. So especially for the first, like the first time I created this subclass, having the, the, essentially the template here and just going in and altering things can help a lot. So you don't forget yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm supposed to get something at level six. Yeah. So. War- Warlocks get a capstone at level 14. That's And that's their capstone. Yep. The clerics got, got a weight, but it's pretty big. <laughs> yeah. So the other nice thing about this is you can see some of these special things that you can do in D&D Beyond that allow you to um, really, that really help with characters when you're using homebrew in your characters. So if you go into, let's start with bonus cantrip. And if we okay. go into edit... And you'll actually see what's listed here is the light spell, which is because we're basing this off of the the light domain. But for my cleric, I'm doing the same thing. You're getting a bonus cantrip, but we're going to give our clerics produce flame. Okay. And so So... you can, not only can you just leave this as, all you have to do is go in and change light to produce flame. And you can see we've got some automatic editing in here in where we're using a uh, spell on either side so that the... Now, when we do this, um, is it one word or a space? It is a space. It's two words. And okay. you'll want to change it in both the description and the snippet. I have a very tiny screen. It's a very tiny screen. It's first level, you're going to produce it. And then, we so have, do we have a description here we want to fill out? Um, so for that, there's no. not much else you have to do. You will want to change a little bit of the, the full description. Um, so the snippet I have is you gain the produce flame cantrip. That's it. So that's what shows up in your character sheet to make life easy. And then the full description is when you choose this domain at first level, you gain the produce flame cantrip. It counts as a cleric cantrip for you, but doesn't count against your number of cantrips known, which the game the the site will do automatically if you do the right things but it's good to have that in the description of your subclass so people know oh i'm getting access to the cantrip i don't normally do and it's not going to count against mm-hmm. them it's an automatically prepared okay so, so do i need to change the wording in the snippet um no nah, you don't need to the the official wording is slightly different but well uh, let's look at what the official wording is so it says you gain the produce flame cantrip nothing else 
Uh, is there any thought to adding the ability to add change classes? Uh, All right. Oh, Archangel wants to know Todd will be making an Averin patron. This comes up a lot. Yes, I well, will be. I will be making an Averin patron, and that will probably be on DM Skill. Yep. Um, save so... changes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> just do it. Just, just save your changes. I have lost so much. <laughs> Um, saving any document yeah and the the reason that it's important in the description to talk about this counts as a cleric cantrip for you but doesn't count against your number of cantrips known is because this produce flame is not a spell that clerics usually get mm -hmm. but for a bunch of different reasons this is an important spell for a phoenix cleric to have because it's a cantrip that does fire damage that also has some other utility uses. It's, right. it's a really useful cantrip. And as you'll see in a couple of other places, one specifically, being able to do fire damage is part of the healing that this cleric can do. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you go to the bottom, so required class level is one, You because clerics get their subclass at first level. Display right. order is how it's actually displayed on that list. In this case, it's one. Um, there's some other options here that we can go into later. We don't want to hide it. Um, and then if you go down to where it says class feature options, you're going to see like level scaling, modifiers, actions. This is where like all the meat happens. Mm. Um, you see where it says spells and there's a little one next to it. We're going to want to open that up because this is where oh. the, this is where D&D Beyond actually pulls the information. So we're going to right, edit that light you... spell. This this is where it's gonna it's going to actually happen. Yep. So delete and now light. Produce flame. And conveniently, it's just gonna find it for me as I start typing. Yep. My app appropriately. And nothing else there. Uh it does not consume a spell slot because it's a cantrip. Um Ooh, do I need to do that? Uh it should say that automatically. You should have already been in there. There's once again, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. It's good to like take the time and get to know it, look through all of the little um uh question marks that are in there. If you ever have any questions, come to our website. Uh yeah. come to the forums. Do uh, not be intimidated because this stuff will scare this stuff scares me. It, and, and it can. Yeah. It, there's a lot going on here. But, but this is just giving you all of the ability, everything that you would want to be able to do. We've given you that. It doesn't mean you have to do all that. Yeah. <laughs> so don't don't panic. Don't panic. Take right. take the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy advice. Yeah, and have a towel. Uh, and then save. And I thought I did, but I will save again. It can never hurt to save. You could just, oh, just save. Just it keep it saving. never gets worse by saving. Yep. All and right. so there we go. That's that's step number one. Uh, so now we're going to get into slightly more fun things. So if we, uh, you're going to want to back out of this. Um, That's a good so, way to back out. So at the top, you're going to see, um, you'll actually see the hierarchy of where we are. Homebrew, Creations, Phoenix Domain, bonus, we're in can bonus okay, cantrip. So just okay. click the Phoenix Domain then. That's what I like to do. It makes it easier. Yeah. Less, uh, less things to go wrong. We could click the plus. We've done our bonus cantrip. And now we have Warding Flare. And yep. boy, do you hit me with Warding Flare a lot. Well, it's very useful. But Warding Phoenix Flare. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, <laughs> listen, as a light domain cleric, having a reaction is super helpful. Uh, that is not something the clerics get on a regular basis. It gives disadvantages. Super cool. This is not what the Phoenix domain has. So let's go ahead and edit that. All right. So what the Phoenix domain have has is called Warmth of the Flame. And this is where you'll understand why fire is such an important thing for a Phoenix cleric to have. Um, and this is also where you'll see some of the more um, fiddly bits in D&D Beyond for displaying things. So... I'll read the full description. Since also I butcher it. Well. No, I'm hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even gonna, you're fine. Uh, also at first level, the destruction of your foes brings warmth to your allies. When you cast a spell of first level or higher that deals fire damage, you can choose to heal one creature of your choice within 30 feet. The creature regains hit points equal to 1d4 plus the spell's level. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus. You regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. So this is why having fire at your disposal is helpful because, and while the cantrip won't help you, having those fire spells that we just gave you will certainly be helpful. And I, this is the description, correct? That's a description. So if you so copy, we switch it over. We're gonna switch it over. Yep. And there it is. Now I've copied and pasted it from her original Word document, so you so, don't have to watch me type. 
I'm going to copy on over you the snippet because the snippet, uh, because this is what appears in the character sheet. Um, because once again, to keep the character sheet easy, it includes some language, basically programming language in there. Um, and you'll see that it's specifically, you can use this mm. feature, proficiency, hashtag unsigned three times. That's the thing that in the character sheet is going to automatically pull, pull your proficiency bonus so that it's not going to say that weird bit of code. It's going to say three, four, five, whatever. Yeah, that's what's going to do the math for you. Yep. That's How, nice. where can you learn about this kind of stuff? Dig into the homebrew, go to our forums. I had to do the same thing. This is this is where the power of d, &D Beyond and homebrew is, is being able to do this kind of stuff. Uh, you could just say in the snippet, you can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus. And most people in their character sheet would go, oh, okay, and look at their proficiency bonus. This will automatically populate that in. And that's what d, &D Beyond does well. Um, I'm clicking save. Yeah, <laughs> click save. Uh, we're going to, it's required class level is one because this is something you also get a first level. Right. Display order is two. Yep. And then we're going to go on down to actions. Okay. So if you scroll down, yeah, I see how it says actions. We're, we're yeah. going to edit that. Because this is not a reaction. Exactly. This is this is a thing you can do a certain number of times, and then you have to take a long rest to get them back. So you so know how on D and D Beyond, yeah. yeah. Um, so the action type is going to be general. Uh, we're calling it Warmth of the Flame. It's not Warding Flare. I'm looking back and forth because I'm just looking at my copy over here to make sure. Uh, you said general, but do you just mean action? Wait, action, no, action type. Um, yeah, so that's activation. Oh. Uh, activation type is not a reaction. Activation type is no action. Action. No action. Because this happens automatically when you do fire damage from a first level spell. Right. And this is called Warmth of the Flame. Warmth of the Flame. All right. Um, let's see. We're not going to edit any of that. Once again, Take a moment. Uh, on We're your not going to edit at... any of this, the snippet, the description? Well, edit the snippet in the description. I'm talking about some of the other um, stuff. So the reset type is long rest. So once again, you get all of it back at a long rest. Um, we would use the snippet from before and the description from before. So you do have to do this twice. You do have to do this twice. Uh, and then hit save when you're done, because always save. And I'm actually going to look at, did we get any more questions? All right, so once the flame is done. Now, it's not quite done oh yet. Oh, my. What? Yeah, I know, right? Go back into <laughs> edit. This happens every once in a while, and where you'll save and it'll back you out. Uh, go beyond where it says snippet and description. You're going to see two things sitting there. You're going to see limited use and level override. Where am I seeing these? Keep going. Keep going. Oh, it's more. more. Oh, yeah, there we go. There we go. Okay. So... The original power was your wisdom modifier. This mm. is your proficiency bonus. And Correct. so the way that I've done this, and, and we won't go through all of this right now because we don't have time, but literally at level one, you get two uses. At level five, you get three uses. At level nine, you get four because it's based on your proficiency bonus. So you go in and edit that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> How do this I do is this? The, um, so it's going to be... Do I, I insert a level every time? Um, yeah, that's what I did. Okay, so level one. So at level one, uh, so number of uses is going to be two because your proficiency bonus at level one is plus two. Uh, the operator is plus addition. The stat modifier Oop, is blank. Knocked me, knocked me down. Yeah, that happens. All right. Go in. Edit. All right. And so, that should be good. And so we would go through and do this for... All every purposes. single level yeah uh so how do i so then i would go wait so i would have to add in another one of these limited uses how would i do that though uh so hit save so you back out yeah and you can see if you we scroll all the way down yeah uh click on the plus button and you can see that there is just the one that we have right add limited use data and we can add another one yeah let's just go ahead and do that so now two uses what happened? What all does that happen? 
So at um, level five, you get three uses because this is your proficiency bonus. Oh, it goes up to three. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So this was based on the fact that a lot of the recent UA that's come out has been um, based on some of these limited use things have been based on proficiency bonus instead of a stat modifier. So I was I was basing some of these limited use stuff off of that. Now I saw um, it disappear when I hit save. Does that mean it didn't happen? Ah, uh, well, we can go check. Hit save and go back. Yeah, I think it just means I'm going to hit cancel. Okay. And see what happens, and we'll see if it's still there. So go ahead and hit the little plus so you can see. Oh yeah, they both they both saved. All right, so I made multiple versions. Even though I hit save at that yep. moment, it just went blank, and I thought I lost my work. Um, I you did can probably not. just delete one of those. Yeah. All right, so let's move on from warmth of the flame. Yep, and uh, we're gonna get into the next one, which is uh, the channel divinity. Okay, and that means I need to go back. Yep, uh, Mick18599 in, in chat asked, what about the cantrip fire bolt? Um, that's also an excellent cantrip. The reason I prefer warmth of the flame, or not, uh, the, the reason I prefer produce flame is not only is it a cantrip that you can use to attack with, but if you read the description, you can hold a fire in your hands. So you could use it as a light source. Yeah. Uh, it's got some RP uses. And so There's a I, lot of role play yeah. use out of that. I think Firebolt is, is powerful and really cool, but I liked uh, Produce Flame for this better. So, and then uh, Lord Garthon wanted to know, will we see the Phoenix Cleric played in, played in a D&D &D Beyond stream? Uh, probably not. And the reason is going to be coming up in a little bit. Um, and this has nothing to do with a D&D Beyond stream and more uh, about how I always recommend if you're going to create something, a homebrew for your own character, talk to your DM. Uh, because I've done something here that I love, but I am going to talk to every single DM way beforehand about ever playing this because uh, I bring up a can of worms and it's fun. So first, uh, Channel Divinity. All right. So right. all clerics get a second channel divinity. They get a first one, which is that they get to destroy undead. And then a second one, which for the uh, light cleric is this radiance of the dawn. Um, what I've called mine is explosion of life. Uh, and I'll send along the snippet to you so you can just stick it on in there because it's got more of the, um, the mechanical stuff in it. Uh, actually, that one doesn't. I think it's good. Uh, so, And I'll read this off. Uh, Starting at second level, you can use your channel divinity to protect your allies with an aura of flames. As an action, you present your holy symbol and a sphere of fiery light emanates from you. The sphere is centered on you, has a 30-foot radius, and is filled with bright light. The sphere moves with you, and it lasts for one minute or until you are incapacitated or die. When a creature, including you, starts its turn in the sphere, you can grant that creature these benefits. The fire bolsters their vitality, giving them 1d8 temporary hit points. The fire protects, gaining resistance to fire damage until the end of its next turn. So I wanted to keep this in the, what is, you know, fire and healing, fire and healing. Um, does this do a ton of temporary hit points? No, it's not a, an amazing amount, but... You know, it refreshes every round. Does it give you immunity to fire damage? No, but resistance in the right circumstances is really powerful. So, um, and it's centered on you so that you can kind of move around in the battlefield. I've always pictured this cleric as the kind of cleric that sits about 30 feet away from everything. You know, close enough to be uh, useful, but far enough away to not be in melee. Mm -hmm. And um, all of this is correct. Required uh, levels, most of that's order. gonna be correct. You're gonna want to go down to actions. Okay. And you'll hit the little plus, and you'll see that uh, this is not Radiance of the Dawn. This is so. This is where the little nitty gritty is. Oh, it's cautioning me about saving. So I'm gonna. Get... We try. We try to caution. Changes you made may not be saved if I click save. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Maybe there's an interruption to. The site. I say, yeah, just say leave. Oh, it saved that. So, yeah. Yeah. Go on down to actions. And if you hit the little plus, you'll see. Okay. Edit. Yeah, we're going to edit that. Uh, obviously, the name. Uh, we're going to get rid of the save type 
because this isn't the original thing they were using the template for was a save. You did this explosion and uh, enemies had to do a save. This case, you just want the uh, the dash because we're okay. not going to do anything. Uh, this one's actually pretty easy because it's, it's something you're giving to other creatures. Um, and then we have to fill this out again. Yeah, and then you would copy and paste that in there. Uh, mm -hmm. Activation type is an action. Um, yep, and that, so the rest of this would basically be the same. And once again, this is, um, I've looked at a lot of other cleric subclasses. I've looked at a lot of other subclasses for other characters that have healing or fire in them to gain not just inspiration, but also how mechanically has stuff been working? How has, how are people used to it to try to find a balance point? Um, and is that it? Uh, yeah, that's basically going to be it. And then we'll, we'll get into the, the, the thing. All right. So now we go into Phoenix domain. Uh, yep. We go, we go back. Cause we're going to do the sixth level ability, All right. which, um, so well, we've we, got, uh, so improved flare is the life is the, uh, light cleric, um, ability. Mm -hmm. at sixth level right we're gonna do something completely different uh and it's called rise from the ashes <laughs> so this is the reason why i said you might not see this cleric in a lot of places um and this was kind of the impetus for this cleric um because this you... is a, this is all about this is very tied to the world that your dm is making and how like when you watch something like critical role <laughs> certain spell components are very important to making things dangerous yeah well and spell components for raising characters from the dead get a lot of attention uh because there's a lot of high level spells that require very expensive components but when you're talking about things like hero's feast or plane shift or other mm. things that require uh an expensive spell component that might be hard to find that gets consumed th it can be part of your game to find and acquire those it can be part it might not be part of your game maybe you just hand wave it away whichever way a lot of those spells those are just can you actually cast the spell it might be related to the adventure that you're on but we're going to be talking about the actual raising from the dead which requires diamonds which get consumed and the reason it gets a lot of attention and it's really important in this case the, the reason that I'm always very cautious about uh, who uses this and, and saying why I might not ever play this on a stream is because um, when you're raising other characters from the dead, there's a lot going on. And the way that your DM handles that world and how it and, and how difficult they want it to be to bring characters back from the dead, that might be part of that game. Um, this cleric does something different. So if you are the kind of DM, or the kind of player who don't want to get into material components but want to keep there being a some cost to bringing a character back from the dead rise from the ashes is it and without reading everything off basically what it allows you to do as a phoenix cleric is you can cast any of the the raise dead spells revivify raise dead um i think it specifically just talks about uh any spell that raises from the dead. So if you have, if you can somehow get access to um, that resurrection, what's the one that druids can do? I've just lost it. Uh, it's reincarnate. Reincarnate um, and true resurrection. All those have very expensive diamond components. When you cast the spell, those, cr those creatures come back with one hit point. If you're a Phoenix cleric, you don't need the spell components. So you can just do it. And they come back with a lot more hit points. So especially at that moment, if you're doing revivify on the fly it makes them a lot more powerful what you trade off is that the cleric then takes the resurrection penalty so uh for raise dead and resurrection those have penalties that those characters usually get so if you've been raised from the dead you have a negative four penalty to everything and it only goes down by one every day if you're a phoenix cleric you take that on yourself mm -hmm. and so this is the balance point um I wanted to do this for those games in where either you want the the cost of doing something that is very tied to being a cleric in general, raising people from the dead, not have anything to do with spell components, uh, which is based 
it's just whether your game needs it or not. Also, I thought it'd be really fun to do a game which is like a dungeon crawl, one of those, um, like we're gonna go through Tomb of Horrors and we're gonna see how 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 much you can survive. And usually they're like meat grinders, except you've got a Phoenix cleric. And so you get to the end of the dungeon and everybody's doing great and have been revived and your Phoenix cleric has a negative 10 to everything. Yeah. <laughs> I found that idea kind of funny and appealing. That is charming. Like everyone's like, whoo, that was a breeze. Um, Phoenix yeah. cleric. Uh, so and what's the snippet? The snippet is, uh, this is a bit longer. I'll go ahead and send this off to you. So this one is not going to require a lot in D&D Beyond because it's mostly descriptive. It's, you're just doing it. And then right. you're casting the spell. You're still using the spell component. You're still using the spell slot. Um, but basically this one is just descriptive and having another character get revived. And this doesn't really require any modifiers doesn't require any modifiers doesn't require anything because it is once again it's just it this is just something that you do which is often the case um there is something on here every that's um oh. what yeah, didn't you, what needed to be changed you uh just go into scroll all the way down i want to make sure that the light cleric didn't have anything in there i don't think they do because it's oh, improved point, flare yeah. nope you're good okay okay so we are fine here and Phoenix domain. We go back here and now we are, we got, we got one more sure on time, or, but we're going to do it. We're going to do yeah. it. We technically have only one more. So potent spell casting is the exact same. Uh, for oh, that's both. right. That's just a standard thing that clerics get in where they get to add their wisdom modifier to cantrips. Oh, um, really? So yeah. So this is actually exactly the same. We don't have to touch it. And this okay, is something. So you kept this or do all clerics get this? Uh, I kept this. This was all. This was something many clerics get. Oh, you're right. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, it, it does come up. Yep. yep. Um, and so the final thing is the level 17, which I call Avatar of Destruction. You're just trying to steal my undead thunder. That's all you're trying to do. I will say I came out with this long before your <laughs> undead UA came out. <laughs> Um, however, I will say also, I took a lot of inspiration from, um, the, the wildfire druid that came out a while ago yeah. and some other clerics that came out, like there's, and a lot of the UA that's come out because uh, there has been so much UA, I've been able to watch a lot of, of, uh, subclass it's, development in general. So it's been fascinating. I mean, that's why I love when everyone, each of them comes out and there's a new iteration because they learn a lot about design when I see it happen. Yep. Um, and those conversations with Jeremy Crawford and all of them always help me like just kind of understand the reasoning behind things. Oops, let me... So, so average, Avatar of Destruction is very much... We experienced experience this in my game that I ran, that you were in, where you, you had some very, very key moments. <laughs> well, and that was all role-playing. This actually yeah, codifies it. This, yeah, exactly. This this makes it real. And this is one of those in where I've gone back and forth. So this one and the, uh, the other one in where you can ignore spell components are kind of the two big things that I got a lot of feedback on. Mm -hmm. um, and this one probably changed the most. So uh, I sent you the snippet. Basically, uh, to make a long story short, if you die, you are reduced to ash and you come back to life the next round. And then when you come back to life the next round, it's an explosion of fire that does fire damage to your enemies and can have a chance to blind them. Um, yeah. and, and it's a lot of damage. It's 2d10 plus your cleric level. It might be enough to finally like, I mean, if you were surrounded by undead, say, if that was to happen. Yeah. I'm not saying it would happen to Orkira or a Phoenix cleric, but if it did and then you died, you would explode and take everything out with you. <laughs> well, the important, so there were a couple of other important things for me to remember. Uh, fire damage, while awesome, is also one of those things that the most monsters and people are resistant to, yes. which is why the, while the fire damage is good and it's, it's nothing to sneer at, the main focus of this is the uh, saving your cleric's life and the possibility of blinding your enemies. So like, um, well, 2d10 plus your level at 17th level is quite a bit of fire damage. There's a good chance the fire damage isn't the thing. Yeah. Um, same reason why the earlier power that we did, while it included being resistant to fire damage, well, if you're in a fight that's not doing, that no one's doing fire damage, 
eh. So also having the temp HP is good. Um, and this was... Yeah, and this is like, you're a 17th level. Uh, like, you do need more <laughs> than yeah. doing a little bit of damage. I mean, you're coming back from the dead. That's great. Um, the you come blinding back from the is dead. quite nice. Yeah, and you return with half your hit points. So essentially, you get to cast re uh, Raise Dead on yourself. Yeah, and we've seen That's... some variants of this, I believe. I believe the... Um, Divine Soul Sorcerer has something like this where you, you come back and you do have half your hit points or something. Yeah. They're, they're tough buggers to kill. I mean, tough tough jerks to kill. I mean, it's it's a 17th level ability, so why not? Also, um, the other reason that I wanted there to be half hit points is because what's more anticlimactic than coming back in flames and epicness with one hit point and then immediately going down again? Like, <laughs> Who likes that? So if you're going to be epic in this moment and come back from the dead and show off the power of the phoenix, uh, give yourself enough hit points to survive. Because at 17th level, chances are something's hitting you for a lot of damage. So, um, And then with this one, the only thing that you have to adjust is if you go all the way down to actions. Uh, yep, that one... You got to change the name. All right. Um, and it's this is a reset on a long rest, which I don't remember offhand if Corona of Light does the same thing. So, so yeah, there is a lot here. So for those of you who are watching um, who are looking at all of the stuff that's not used, this is kind of normal for a subclass for D and D Beyond because remember we're we're using a template for a cleric, but this is the same forms that you would use for any subclass. So there are a bunch of options here. And so if you want to get super weird and creative with your subclass, you can do some amazing things. Yeah. But I highly recommend start with looking at templates um, and altering from there. Remember, you do not have to publish what you are playing around with. If it, the published stuff needs to be your stuff, you need to own it, it needs to be different than what's already published. Um, but you can, it automatically makes things private when you create things. I just looked at the way a whole bunch of subclasses were made and asked a lot of questions on the forums and of the mods and in Discord and learned how to do stuff. And I'm on version 2.5 of this character, of this subclass in order to get the thing that I wanted that also performs the way I want in your character sheet. And this is done, right? Yeah, so you can actually get the Phoenix let's, domain. Let, let's let's bring let's break the world. You're gonna make Averin a Phoenix cleric? Edit. <laughs> At level twenty. And this is something else that I've done a lot. I have level twenty copies, so um, I'm, as... I'm just destroying because uh, this is a work I'm doing for something later tonight. <laughs> just yeah, because you, you don't have like several other copies of a, of of uh, in there yeah hey i've been grinding them into meat for the sake of continuity for everyone so um so if we go to perf uh yeah i'm gonna learn about medicine <laughs> and so if we go to D divine well, domain it should be listed in there as long as you have a uh, homebrew content available let's make it six level let's yeah. let's be rational i mean we? or you could i could just have you pull up one of my characters uh so, phoenix domain right there phoenix domain and I got all that And stuff. it should show you all of the information the way that you normally would. It should, you know. And I'm the perfect cleric. That's what's really important that everyone know about Averin. Got all those spells that we like, what we chose. Yep. There they are. Fireball. I'm going to toll the dead as Averin. I'm going to burn you. And then I'm going to like, you got hurt. I'm going to command I'm you up. to drop uh. your gold. I'm taking a quick look to see if there's any other questions that we Can I missed. inflict some wounds on you? <laughs> uh, if you are interested in leaving feedback, uh, you can come and see feedback of, uh, you can leave feedback officially on anything that's been uh, published. So if you come to, let me actually get the link. If you go to the one that I have published that is out there that you can then officially add to your your character if you want, there's also a place there where you can leave feedback. Um, and that's on anything that's published. So if if you just want to tell somebody, hey, I downloaded your subclass and I thought it was cool and I, I wanted to let you know because that's all feedback. All feedback should just be, you're awesome. You should always choose Animate Dead also because we know how Phoenix clerics love Undead. <laughs> 
that's that's not that's you know we have very different philosophies on this it's cleric but sure <laughs> sure yeah. if that's the way you want to roll <laughs> i'm actually uh, notoriously using my original roles from when i was a kid uh for my character right now in silver and steel and so this is the phoenix domain bam with a glaive because with a glaive <laughs> With a glaive. Oh, the, I, which I have disadvantage at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But well, for you reasons. Know, for, but reasons. for reasons. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you, Lauren Urban, for showing us how to homebrew subclasses. This is really exciting stuff to have, actually. Sure. And uh, if, as I said, if you have any questions, I highly recommend come to our forums, come to our Discord, ask those questions. Um, those this are is what it looks places. like right here, by the way. She sent me the, the link that you can check out if you're browsing homebrew. And can we get that? To, can we get that link in chat as well? Is it in chat? I'm sure it's in chat because our mods are awesome and they have access to it. Uh, but yeah, you can. I thought I sent you the link. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Oh, I'm still seeing Avrin. Avrin the cleric. Oh, I am a silly, silly goose. I am on the wrong browser. Ah, uh, it happens. So yeah, definitely come by the forums, ask questions. I think you just copied. If you drop to zero hit points, you're outright killed. You're immediately. I know, yes, I absolutely did. I am, yeah. I, I am making mistakes. Yeah, I, am a, right. I am a it's creature fine. of flaws. Come to our forums, ask questions there. There are people who will help you. There are people who will read through any homebrew that you're working on that can help you play test. There are people who will uh, be happy to help you try to figure out how to create it in D and D Beyond. If you're uh, new at that or are trying to do something fun and weird and and quirky, share your homebrew with people if it is um if you can make it public and it's something that you own go ahead and share it um and you can actually see i've got the second version if you scroll down a little bit you'll see previous versions um mm. the reason we do this and i'll explain this real quick if you put a version out there and you make it public and it's awesome and people add it to their character sheets and then you go oh i need to i'm going to change this i'm going to update this i'm going to do that the reason that you need to create a new version is because if you just were able to edit the original version it would break people's character sheets so mm. i had an original version on there that i put out and a whole bunch of people gave me a bunch of really good feedback and i got a professional editor and now version two is out there but anyone who had version 1.5 their character sheets aren't broken because they still have access to it so oh, that's nice that is if you are updating any of your homebrew uh and you need help with how to do that ask on our forums fantastic all right i'm just gonna tell under... people to go to our forums 10 million <laughs> times <laughs> Thank you, Lord Urban, so much for showing us how to uh, to create our homebrew subclasses on D&D Beyond, allowing you, and also that for kind of walking us through your path of designing your own subclass. It's a, for me, it's terrifying. I've done it a few times, but I always, oof, it's so hard. It's so much harder than anyone thinks it's going to be. But um, fun, but super fun and do it and then yeah. uh, put it out into the world and be okay with people being like, this is overpowered. If it makes you happy and it makes other people happy, that's all that matters. All right. Thank you, everyone. Go check out the Phoenix Domain Cleric and go make some homebrew. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you.